So back to Nome. We are back with our live impromptu Sabbath learning. I thought part one was super enjoyable and super fun. So here we are again with Leora and Malachi and Kylan is with us now too. Our own went to the restroom. So, you can follow along with the blog. Um, I have that link in the in the comments. If you'll scroll down on the blog, there's going to be a picture of a gold star of David sitting on top of some Hebrew text. We are the paragraph right above that, jumping back into the parasha of Beha Alotecha. Do you remember what it means, guys? No. To count? To lift, to, to draw when on you, him. When you draw on you. Set up. When set you up. set up. Good job. We I talked about a lot of neat things in the first part. We had some great questions. So if you have questions, please comment them. That way we can talk are? about it together. One of my questions to mm. Did you show us? Yep, and if we want to go back over the questions, that'll be easy to do because we got it all on video. But we're going to jump right in from where we left off now in the book of Numbers. The Mead Bar, chapter 9, verse 9 through 14. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If any man will be, do you want some of these or these? Um, I'm contaminated I'm through a human corpse I'm looking for a or will be on a distant road whether yeah, you <clears throat> the finish. that's like my cake stuff whether you or for your generations he shall make the Pesach offering for Hashem in the second month, on the fourteenth day, in the afternoon shall they make it, with matzos and bitter herbs shall they eat it. They shall not leave over from it until morning, nor shall they break a bone of it. Like all the decrees of the Pesach offering shall they make it. But a man who is pure, and was not on the road, and had refrained from making the Pesach offering, that soul shall be cut off from its people. For he has not offered Hashem's offering in its appointed time. That man will bear his sin. I'm sorry, this is a fabric marker. I don't know why that was in there. That should have been in my little spot. Sorry, buddy, but you can use anything else. That man shall bear his sin. When a convert shall dwell with you, and he shall make the Pesach offering to Hashem, according to the decree of the Pesach offering and its law, so shall he do. One decree shall be for you, for the proselyte and the native of the land. So if you remember, we were talking about the second Passover and how second chances are readily available for us, but it has to take our initiative to want it. And we talked about repenting and turning around. Um, in this verse, it's very important. There are several times in the Torah we get what is known as karet, being cut off from your people. There are specific reasons for that. So one of them is... If you had the opportunity to do the Pesach offering in its proper time and you didn't do it, you just decided you didn't do it. Because nothing was holding you back, you didn't have like what we talked about, the contamination from the dead, you weren't way too far away and completely unable to do it, or caught up with something else that was an emergency, you just chose, I'm not going to do this feast of the Lord. I'm not going to go do the Pesach. I'm not going to go be seen by Hashem. Well, you have to come back. You have to raise your hand. And you have to ask. No, you have to ask first. That's what we do is we ask first. And then you did it. You can get some water, but you need to listen. Excuse me. You're walking away and I'm still talking to you. Walk all the way around because baby's resting in that room. You walk all the way around to the door. The side side door, okay? And I want you going through this door here. It might wake up the baby, okay? And come back around the same way. 
so I think this is important. But let's go ahead and go on unless there's a comment. So the beauty of the idea that one can approach the Lord with a heartfelt request, with the intention and desire to perform His will and act in accordance with His guidelines for worship and study, prayer and observance, and be answered, is an amazing thing to think about. It was because of God's understanding and compassion for the human circumstances that this second Pesach was decreed by God. There is little research done among many churchgoers as the prevalence as to the prevalence of anti-Semitism among the early church fathers. And as this opportunity arises here, let us take a look at just one of many examples with the Spirit leading us. Please read what the impression of this blessed decree made by God was turned into by Constantine. And let us ask ourselves a very relevant question. What other ideas from Scripture may, they, may have become distorted by man? Go inside and go sleep then, okay? Go ahead and lay down, okay? For their own purposes. Have we done a diligent job in seeking out how these distortions may be affecting the current doctrinal systems to which we may be adhering? If you need to go lay down, you should go lay down. If you need water, go get water and go lay down, okay? So the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., um, from the letter of the Emperor Constantine to all those not present at the council. This is found in Eusebius uh, Vita Const Constantine. And then they have a chapter reference. It's 3 and 18 through 20. And this is, um, again, a writing from 325 A.D., when the question relative to the sacred festival of Easter arose, it was universally thought that it would be convenient that all should keep the feast on one day. It was declared to be particularly unworthy for this, the holiest of festivals, to allow the customs, the calculation of the Jews, who had soiled their hands with the most fearful of crimes, and whose minds were blinded, in rejecting their custom, we may transmit to our descendants the legitimate mode of celebrating Easter. We ought not to, therefore, have anything in common with the Jew, for the Savior has shown us another way, our worship following a more legitimate and more convenient course. The order of the days of the week, and consequently, in unanimously adopting this mode, we desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jew. For it is truly shameful for us to hear them boast that without their direction we could not keep this feast. How can they be in the right, they who after the death of the Savior have no longer been led by reason but by wild violence as their delusion may urge them? They do not possess the truth in this Easter question, for in their blindness and repugnance to all improvements they frequently celebrate two Passovers in the same year. We could not imitate those who are openly in error. How then could we follow these Jews who are most certainly blinded by error? For to celebrate a Passover twice in one year is totally inadmissible. But even if this were not so, it would still be your duty not to tarnish your soul by communication with such wicked people, the Jews. You should now consider not only that the number of churches in these provinces make a majority, but also that it is right to m demand what our reason approves, and that we should have nothing in common with the Jews. It sounds like Hitler. It sounds like Hitler. Well, Hitler takes a lot of his learning and the sentiment from these early church fathers. So this is, this to me is, it's terrible, right? It's so anti-Semitic. And, um, and I think it's a little humorous, if it weren't so horrific, that they that he's saying in their, um, yeah, uh, in their blindness and repugnance uh, to all improvements, they frequently celebrate two two Passovers in the same year. We could not imitate those who are in such open error. 
And what did we just read about? We read about the second Passover being what? Uh, a second chance. Second chance, second opportunity that these people so much wanted to serve Hashem, so much wanted to partake of the second pass of the of the Passover. But they thought to themselves, look, we're taking care and like the uh you know, the writings state that it, it it may have been the people who were carrying Yosef's bones up from Egypt. Either way, anyone attending to the dead is doing a great service. So becoming contaminated, that means unable to approach, you know, the holiness of the um, tabernacle or the temple. Yeah, that's so funny. It just doesn't seem right to them. They they want to so much be a part of it. Um, yet they, yet they, they probably were a part of crucifying it. Yet they were probably yelling at or. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm not sure about that comment, but these people, uh, so this Council of Nicaea, this Constantinian document that we just read, baby, is talking about, it's really anti-Semitic towards the Jews, and it's telling, basically, you know, because the Savior has shown us a different way, it said it there. Now, that is interesting, because Yeshua took the entire Torah and lived it as an observant Jewish man when he walked on this earth in the flesh. So the error I see is here. Besides the fact that it's really hate-filled, right? Mm -hmm. It's very ugly. So at any rate, um, the point of that all is just to say that you can take and distort something very beautiful, that second chance that, that Pesach Shani teaches us, and you can turn it into a reason to to mock somebody, I guess. It was worse than mocking, though, because a lot of death comes from these early church fathers' writings. I mean, like you said, you mentioned Hitler. It sure does sound like Hitler because he got a lot of his um, ideas from his love of, I think, Luther's writings in particular, who was very anti-Semitic at one point in his, um, in his life. Luther is the founder of the Lutheran faith. And basically breaking off from the Catholic Church. But that's another story. So we're going to go on on the blog. Hey, um, Malachi, when you're erasing so uh, vehemently, it, it like moves the whole table. So let's not do that, please. Okay, you can erase, but just a little more gently. According to the word of Hashem, they would journey, it says in our parasha. There is not a more poignant text I can think of in scripture. Here, let's blow our nose over here, okay? Thank you. This is, in essence, what life is all about. Did you write this all? Yeah, except for the Bible verses. And I didn't write that last section. That was taken out of a different writing that was... So there is not a more poignant text I can think of in scripture. This is, in essence, is in essence what life is all about. If we are to live our lives according to this template seen in the wilderness, everything would fall into place. Act according to his word, think according to his word, speak according to his word, react and interact according to his word. Why don't you go over there? Thank you. Make investments and travel according to his word. The Lord wants to make it very evident for all of his people. Those that are called, live according to his word. The cloud is the daily reminder for the people that his providence is over them. And six times in three verses is the same statement made in Numbers 9.18, and 9.23. According to the word of Hashem, they would journey. As I have mentioned before, in the Targum, the Aramaic translation, and I have Onkelos, there are different Targums, um, this term Memra replaces the term word, or the word word. Memra means word, or wisdom of the Lord, and is identified as the expressed image of the invisible God. And it relates to Yeshua in the form of fire and cloud. As I studied with my daughter this Sabbath, it became highly evident from the intensity of purpose and repetition in the text that the Lord seemed to be drawing our attention to the ideas of complete reliance 
obedience, perseverance, and dedication. Not for an hour, day, week, month, or year, but for a lifetime. So may it be, my king, that all your children hearken and look to the cloud and the fire, which will guide us at all times, every step of the way. Um, and this, this entry is from 2013. This is one of my earliest entries. Um, and Kyle and I had told them all, if you do want to comment or have a question, you definitely feel free to okay. uh, raise your hand first. Okay. Okay. okay, going on with the meat bar 9, 15 through 23. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle that was the tent for the testimony, and in the evening there would be upon the tabernacle like a fiery appearance until morning. So it would always be. The cloud would cover it, and an appearance of fire at night. And whenever the cloud was lifted from atop the tent, afterward the children of Israel would journey. And in the place where the cloud would rest, there the children of Israel would encamp. According to the word of Hashem, would the children of Israel journey. And according to the word of Hashem, they would encamp. And sometimes the cloud would remain from evening until morning. And the cloud would be lifted in the morning, and they would journey. Or for a day and a night, and the cloud would be lifted, and they would journey. Or for two days, or a month, or a year. When the cloud would linger over the tabernacle, Resting upon it, the children of Israel would encamp and would not journey, but when it was lifted, they would journey. According to the word of Hashem would they journey. The charge of Hashem would they safeguard according to the word of Hashem through Moshe. So I think that's really cool and I think that's really interesting. And I think for these times, we really need to be ready to wake up in the morning and something unexpected be. Maybe. Yeah. And be ready to go, right? Because we just, I love you. We don't know these things. Because we don't know. It's very, um, and it would be really nice if, if we knew we could wake up to Hashem just guiding us and leading us through. And He is, in a way, in a lot of ways. The silver trumpets. These trumpets are specially made, crafted in a similar manner as the menorah, beaten into shape. Their functions, summoning the assembly, Summoning the leaders, identifying the start of a journey, and indicating which tribe will move and when. Invading enemies and battle. The list goes on. They would announce appointed feast days, days of gladness, Rosh Chodesh. This is my book, honey. I don't, like, I don't have many books of my own. But that one's mine. Does anybody have any paper our own can use? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Just hand him yeah. one when you guys get a yeah. chance. When I get a chance, I'll look at it. Okay, and then, so, Rosh Chodesh, the new month, was announced by the silver trumpets over the burnt and feast peace offerings. Thank you for so many hugs, but did I tell you all about that? I think you're doing it on purpose. Okay, yeah. so let's be polite and let's be respectful to me and follow what I had discussed with you prior to pressing go left. Okay? Thank you, Lai. So, Rosh Kadesh over the burnt and feast peace offerings also. Why are these, and I think I'm referring to the following verses, so beautiful? This is a very literal and functional section that teaches us about the divine order and plan of Hashem. It is amazing to me that as we become accustomed to studying the Torah each cycle and learning new things each year, it is as if our hearts are becoming fine-tuned to each and every sound as the Lord speaks through his eternal word, beckoning, calling, inviting us to grasp this tree of life. Through the sound of our response to the king, our answer to his bidding, we are remembered before him. Amazing. The Lord is preparing us for the days to come. May we hear the sound near the end, and in repentance and growing trust, respond to our coming king before his arrival. So now I'm going to read, you're going to wait a minute, I'm going to read this section, and then I will check on what you need. The need bar 10, so the book of Numbers, um, chapter 10, verse 1 through 10. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Make for yourselves two silver trumpets. Make them hammered out, and they shall be yours for the summoning of the assembly and to cause the camps to journey. 
when they sound a long blast with them, the entire assembly shall assemble to you to the entrance of the tent of meeting. If they sound a long blast with one, the leaders shall assemble to you, the heads of Israel's thousands. When you sound short blasts a second time, the camps resting to the south shall journey. When you sound short blasts a second time, the camps, oh sorry, short blasts shall they sound for their journeys. When you gather together the congregation, you shall sound a long blast, but not a short blast. The sons of Aaron, the Kohanim, shall sound the trumpets, and it shall be for you an eternal decree for your generations. Have when these so No, these ones were the silver trumpets. That's a good question and distinction to make. So, yeah. Um, and I'm sure that they would sound those as well. You are supposed to blow the shofar over Rosh Chodesh and the offerings and different things. But these specifically had to be also done for these things, uh, these different occasions. So there was also the sons of our own, the Kohanim, shall sound the trumpets, and it shall be for you an eternal decree for your generations. When you wage war in your land against an enemy who oppresses you, you shall sound short blasts of the trumpets, and you shall be recalled before Hashem your God, and you shall be saved from your foes. On the day of your gladness, and on your festivals, and on your new moons, you shall sound the trumpets of your burnt offerings, and over your feast peace offerings, and they shall be a remembrance for you before your God. I am Hashem your God. Okay, I'm pausing. You, what do you need? No, remember I said not until after this section and lunch and we will have getting something, okay? Little scissors? Um, that would be fine, but you have to go around, like I said. And Malachi, that was a good comment that you made about asking about the shofars, but you have to raise your hand first. And then you were saying, I have a question. Instead of having a question out loud in words where it's interrupting, you raise your hand, and I promise I'll call on you. So what was um, your question? When is the Torah when they lift Moshe's hands up? That was just leaving Egypt. Um, so let me see. I think it might have been Yitro, actually. I think it was Parsha Yitro. Okay. If well, I'm well, not... I'm sorry, what? I wasn't really listening. Okay, we can read that. I want to read that with you if you'd like to. I love that, Parsha. That's one of my favorite. That is one of my favorite ones. Have a seat on your bottom, please. You guys are getting a little bit off here, I think. And that is okay. I'm going to just check something really quick. Uh, uh, message come in. Veshamru lene Israel et hashabat laso et hashabat le Torah tamiri olam. Veshamru lene Israel et hashabat laso. And the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to make the Sabbath an eternal covenant throughout their generations. Alright, I checked what I needed to check. I'm going to continue on. Now we're going to read Yehezkiel or Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 2 through 6. When I bring the sword of war upon a land, the people of the land take one man from among them and set him as a sentinel for themselves. If he sees the sword coming upon the land, he blows the shofar and warns the people, and the listener hears the sound of the shofar, but does not take heed, and the sword comes and takes him, his blood will be upon his head. He heard the sound of the shofar, but did not take heed, so his blood will be upon him. He had, had he taken heed, he would have saved his soul. But if the sentinel saw the sword coming and he did not blow the shofar and the people were not warned and the sword came and took a soul from among them, he was taken for his own iniquity. But I will seek his blood 
from the sentinel's hand. So it's after the mana. Oh, you told me. Yeah, after the mana. Okay, we'll check that out later. Mm -hmm. There is an amazing hope that fills my being when I think about the day when Yeshua will return and be exalted. He will call to his people from the four corners of the earth. We will camp under his banner and we will all be gathered in at the sound of his shofar. This is why we pray each day with this hope firm and forefront when we come across challenge. It says, sound the great shofar for our freedom, raise the banner, and gather our exiles. Gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Blessed are you, Hashem, who gathers in the dispersed of his people Israel. Isaiah 11.10 It shall be on that day that the descendant of Jesse, who stands as a banner for all the peoples, nations will seek him, and his resting place will be glorious. He will raise the banner for the nations and assemble the castaways of Israel. And he will gather in the dispersed ones of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And Psalm 89, 16, praises, oh, let's sing this one if you remember it. I don't know if you remember it. So, uh, Psalm 89, 16 through 19. Praises to the people who know the shofar's cry. Hashem, Hashem. By the illumination of your countenance, they walk, they walk, they walk in your name, they rejoice all day long. And through your righteousness, they are exalted. And then 18 for you are the splendor of their power, and through your favor our pride will be exalted. For to Hashem belongs our shield, and to the Holy One of Israel our King. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 7. Even with lifeless musical instruments, such as a flute or a harp, how will anyone recognize the melody if one note can't be distinguished from another? And if the bugle or the shofar gives an unclear sound, who will be ready for battle? Hey Malachi, can you please care more about what we're doing than that eraser playing with it? Thank you. Appreciate that. Reading the English text of your Bible is wonderful. Any reading you do is great. I don't need to go into how many versions and translations of the Bible text there are. Or which has been completely trimmed and altered to suit the dogma of the day in which it was written. I will simply say this. If you do not learn the Hebrew, or at least do, at the very least do some research as the Bible code of God written in the holy language, you will miss out and miss out big. These are the instances in the Tanakh, Tanakh referring to the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, um, Genesis through Malachi, wherein the Hebrew text is written in a certain design. For example, the text at the Song of the Sea is written to resemble two walls of water with the people passing through, or there will be in large letters or small letters. The text in our Torah portion is one of these instances, and it is very unique. Surrounding these scripture lines from the Midbar, Numbers 10, 35 to 36, there are two upside down and backwards letter news, as if they were parentheses. And if you're looking at the blog, you can see the image of showing you what I'm talking about. Every Hebrew letter has a number order with a numerical value. Each has a meaning, and when it's spelled out, another meaning. The letter noon means life or perpetuity. I cannot tell you exactly what these noons can mean, but the fact that they are upside down and backwards Can you please put down your coffee cup and stop tapping it with your spoon? Be respectful and listen, please. But the fact that they are upside down and backwards 
would hint at the opposite of their meaning in the correct inscription, life versus death. Something to think about, something to explore for um, a good comprehensive teaching on this. I would refer you to El Shaddai Ministries US. There is an audio entitled Hidden Treasures, and I think it was the letter Moon. This is again an old entry. The need to bar 10, we'll go numbers 10, 33 <clears> through 36. They journeyed from the mountain of Hashem a three days distance. And the Ark of the Covenant of Hashem journeyed before them a three days distance to search out for them a resting place. I'll take that, please. Thank you. You can sit and draw, okay? There's no toys in the Shabbat for our family. Today's Hashem's day is a different kind of day. The cloud of Hashem was over them by day and then journeyed from the camp. When the Ark would journey, Moshe would say... Uma, Adonai. Arise, Hashem, and let your foes be scattered. Let those who hate you flee from before you. And when it rested, he would say, Reside tranquilly, O Hashem, among the myriad thousands of Israel. After being camped at Sinai for a year, the people are making their first journey at the bidding of Hashem. In formation, with the sounding of the silver trumpets, the ark is before them, and onward they go. After three short days, they camp according to the resting of the cloud. At this point, the complaints start. They are not specific, but it is clear enough that whatever they were regarding, Water. the fury of Hashem was provoked. So let's see. In the Midbar 11, the people took to seeking complaints. You almost knocked this over, so please be careful. Thank you, I heard him. We'll give it just a minute. The people took to seeking complaints. It was evil in the ears of Hashem, and Hashem heard, and his wrath flared, and a fire of Hashem burned against them, and it consumed at the edge of the camp. The people cried out to Moshe. Moshe prayed to Hashem, and the fire died down. He named that place Tabera, or conflagration, for the fire of Hashem had burned against them. While the incident above could not be blamed on anyone specific, as we read on, we find that the rabble, or this term mixed multitude, or those who had come up with the Hebrews from <coughs> Egypt, are the ones who are cultivating, or this word shoe sliding back, they're turning around, they're turning back this craving, for ta'ava, or lusting, longing, and desire. So it's the mi mixed multitude that is um, sliding back, or turning back towards this craving, or lusting, longing, or desire. And it's more than just food. This is a human condition. They yearn, or ava, they covet, desire, lust, long, wish for meat. Is that really what this is about? Oh, and I'll just read this part. And Malik, if you want to go just jump back ahead and carry him out here, and I'll oh, I'm sure he'll want to come right to me. And then he can sit back down. Thank you, son. The Midbar 11, 4 through 6, and then 10. The rabble that was among them cultivated a craving, and the children of Israel also wept once more and said, Who will feed us meat? We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt, free of charge. Cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now our life is parched. There is nothing. We have nothing to anticipate but this manna. Moshe heard the people weeping in their family groups, each one at the entrance of his tent. And the wrath of Hashem flared greatly. And in the eyes of Moshe, it was bad. Weeping, whining, complaining, murmuring, grumbling. These complaints undermined a commitment to holiness, to closeness with God. The manna speaks of the straight and narrow path, the provision of the Lord, and suddenly there is a critical spirit and blasphemy. The manna was sent with a question, to see whether my people will walk in my Torah or not. 
And now they are rejecting it as useless, outdated, and undesirable. They need something new. Like, I got a but I don't want a TV Something like that, right? I need something new. The text even uses the same word as bemoan, baka, as if in mourning. This grumbling is a sign of unbelief. All these expressions are a sign of weak faith. God asks his people to believe, to be genuinely content with his provision, and to confess that he is all that we need. To rest in the deliverance of the Father with childlike faith, contentment in God is the sure fruit of genuine faith. Contentment, bless you, bless you. Contentment flows from a heart that has learned to trust God. Combat any murmuring or complaining in your life or those around you with a heart of constant thanksgiving. And that is really cool that we're reading this right now. Because do you remember what I told you or shared with you about Lily's message? Yeah. What was it? Um, about contentment? Yeah. Um, so my friend Lily just passed away. And one of the last things that she taught me, because of what I had said, I've been talking a lot about the children to her, which obviously I always, that's pretty much all I talk about when I'm away from them. So I just said, I just want them to be happy. And she said, oh, yeah. happy goes up and it goes down. Happiness is fleeting. It's like an emotional thing, right? It comes and it goes. It can come real fast, right? Like you can get happy about something and excited and have pleasure real fast. And then in the next moment, what can happen? It can be fun, right? Super fast. So happiness is elusive, but she taught me that contentment is really what we want to look for and what we can do. The difference with contentment, contentment, you can choose. You remember how we started out with Arsha talking about choice, that choice is freedom? So we can choose contentment. So let's just say anything. Say there's a meal we don't like. Malachi, please stop playing with that. Please pay attention and be respectful. That's the second time I'm asking you. So let's say like we get a plate of food for dinner and it's not something we particularly like. We can choose to be content with what we have and suddenly we feel a little bit better about it. Or like Lily, she had cancer, even though, of her lungs, even though she never smoked a day in her life, was super healthy. And she chose contentment. She chose not to be mad at God. She chose not to complain, ever. And it's not that she's perfect. Nobody's perfect, but she's definitely an example. And I want to take that teaching um, that she gave over in her last days. Contentment is a choice. Happiness is an emotion. And so we can always choose to be content. I'm going to go on. Philippians 4, 10 through 13. In union with the Lord, I greatly rejoice that now, after this long time, you have let your concern for me express itself again. Of course, you were concerned for me a long time, all along. But you had no opportunity to express it. Not that I am saying this to call attention to any need of mine, since, as far as I'm concerned, can I have that, please? That which is more important than what we're doing here? Thank you. As far as I'm concerned, I have learned to be content, regardless of circumstances. I know what it is to be in want, and I know what it is to have more than enough. In everything and in every way, I have learned the secret of being full and being hungry, of having abundance and being in need. I can do all things through him who gives me power. The need bar numbers 11 and 11 through 
15. Moshe said to Hashem, Why have you done evil to your servant? Why have I not found favor in your eyes? That you place the burden of this entire people on me? Bless you. Did I conceive this entire people? Bless you. Or did I give birth to it? That you say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a suckling to the land that you swore to its forefathers. Where shall I get meat that we may eat? I alone cannot carry this entire nation, for it is too heavy for me. And if this is how you deal with me, then kill me now. If I have found favor in your eyes, let me not see my evil. So nice. Can you imagine talking to God like that? Yeah. yeah they had a pretty good friend. Very close relationship. Moshe to God. And um, so, I'll just read on and see what I said here in the commentary. To me, this text is incredible. God, Moshe pleads with God, even to kill him, if the people cannot be illuminated to become changed. It is not as if is simply read a cry of woe and despair. The godly leader Moshe goes first to Hashem with a genuine heart of concern for the people. These problems they were creating are seen as spiritual lack rather than an attack on him personally. Yet he holds himself personally accountable as if, bless you, to express his own perceived failure as a leader, unable to help facilitate this heart change. By asking that the Lord kill him, that he might not see his own evil or transgression, amazing example of the humility of Moshe. So, at first reading, did you think that this was like a like a humble cry? Yeah. But when you think about it, it's really he's like, I can't do this. I'm not good enough to make these people change their heart. You know, basically, God, you're gonna have to help me do this and um and as you read on you find out god doesn't say how dare you feel this way or anything of the sort he gives him help right yeah so let's go into the next part smote we're going back to smote exodus 7 and 26 hashem said to moshe let's go down Okay. Mm, I love you. Hashem said to Moshe, Come to Paro and say to him, Want some water? Yeah, please stop that around here. Give it to me, please, son. Right here in my hand, please. Right here, please. And then, and then we're going to go inside and uh, we're going to have to have some consequences for being disobedient like that. But first, Shema 7.26. Hashem said to Moshe, come to Paro and say to him, so said Hashem, send out my people that they may serve me. But if you refuse to send out, behold, I shall strike your entire boundary with frogs. The river shall swarm with frogs and they shall ascend and come into your palace and into your bedroom and into your bed and into the house of your servants and your people and into your ovens and into your kneading bowls and into you and your people and all your servants will the frogs ascend. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frog infestation ascended and covered the land of Egypt. They piled them up into heaps and heaps and the land stank. How does it say um, that, I don't know, it's just that they are going to become as if they're coming out of your ears. And that's going to come in handy here in a minute when we're reading about something in the mead bar. So check out the reason why I put all those. And the quail account. Exactly, right? So the mead bar 11, 18, to the people you shall say, prepare yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of Hashem, saying, Who will feed us meat? For it was better in Egypt. So Hashem will give you meat, and you will eat. Not for one day shall you eat, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, until an entire month of days, until it comes out of your nose, 
and becomes nauseating to you because you have rejected Hashem who is in your midst and you have wept before him saying why did we leave Egypt sound familiar and you know the Torah doesn't waste words so when we see this not one not two not five not ten what is Hashem doing exactly what Except is that just saying and Abraham are you with God until he lowers the number to mm-hmm. ten feet? It's emphasis, right? Yeah. If the Torah is going out of its way to go like this, it's emphasis. So a wind went forth from Hashem, does that sound familiar also? And blew quail from the sea and spread them over the camp. A day's journey this way and a day's journey that way. Wow, that's a lot of quail. All around the camp and quail two cubits. Close. A cubit is what close to an arm length on a grown man and two cubits above the face of the earth. The meat was still between their teeth, not yet chewed, when the wrath of Hashem flared against the people and Hashem struck a very mighty blow against the people. He named the place Kibroth Hata'ava because there they buried the people who had been craving. Oh, they buried the, the eyes? Yeah. No. Those who had been. Remember, we talked about the craving, the cultivating the desire, the cultivating that that desire. Is quail a quail is a clean bird. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. Was So it is amazing to me that the texts of Exodus and Bamidbar are about a plague. They both have the same connotation of specificity as to the effect this will have on the peoples involved. They both end in piles and piles of flesh and death, going back to the concept of punishment versus the consequences we bring on ourselves. This is what God had warned about repeatedly, saying, we have two scriptures here in Exodus 15:26. If you hearken diligently to the voice of Hashem your God and do what is just in His eyes, give ear to His commandments and observe all His decrees, then any of the de- diseases that I placed in Egypt I will not bring upon you, for I am Hashem your healer. And in Devarim 28:58, but if you will not be careful to perform all the words of this Torah that are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, Hashem your God. Then Hashem will make extraordinary your blows and the blows of your offspring, great and faithful blows, and evil and faithful illnesses. He will bring back upon you the sufferings of Egypt, of which you were terrified, and they will cleave to you. quail came down raining meat so kind of like the frogs came up then upon the land the quails flew in from where I don't know God well, from God but I mean yeah raining quail raining frogs you get when it says you know like you're swimming in something that means you have so much of it that mm-hmm. it's just a lot around you, all around you, like water surrounds you when you swim. So I think that's kind of the idea of raining quail and raining. How big was the Red Sea? The Sea of Reeds? I don't know, but we could find that out probably an estimated amount. Yeah, but I was thinking that they could just swim. If they could yeah. swim, if they could swim, there would be no need to part the sea, right? Yeah. If they could yeah, swim, I they could just swim, or they could get in the boat, or they could do that. But apparently, God it was. God wanted to see a miracle. Well, He yeah. wanted to perform. That was one of the greatest things. That was kind of like part of, because people separate the ten plagues in Egypt from that. But that was almost like they, they would call it the eleventh plague or the eleventh miracle, because that was really that last thing to kind of close the door on their Egypt life. Um, but no, I don't think that they could just swim across it. Why would they it had to be an impossible thing. Why would they want to go back to Egypt? That's a really good question. So Egypt was, even though it was hard, it was something they were familiar with. 
they had been in their mind every single day. This is what I do. This is who I am. I'm just a slave. I get up. I make bricks. Mm -hmm. I suffer. Mm -hmm. I fear. Mm -hmm. I can't own land. I can't speak for myself. I can't choose which day I rest. I can't choose really what I eat. And also they had been numbed by the way that they would give them like alcohol to drink and just so they would keep going. Uh, and again, feed them so they'd be strong enough to be burdened. The food that they got in Egypt was to make them strong enough to be exploited. The handouts that they got in Egypt. So, well, this is what they said. Watermelons and leeks and fish in abundance. It was free. Why do you think it was free? It was free so they could control you. And this is what we're seeing now. So, so what I'm saying as an answer to your question is sometimes we get comfortable in a bad routine. And it's harder to leave that bad routine and follow Hashem and go out into, they don't know what. A lot of times we don't know what God wants or where he's leading us. That's harder to do. But the reward is that even if you're maybe a little hotter, maybe if you're a little more thirsty, maybe a little hungrier, maybe a little more lonely, maybe a little more confused, maybe a little more like wondering what's going to be, you're still with Hashem. He's there and he's in the cloud and he's in the fire and he's leading you and you can see his presence there in your life and you know you're walking towards something great. You just don't know exactly how long it's going to take or how you're going to get there. To me, that's still better than being bound in a bad routine. Question. Can you go to the way back then? You can have boats. I what? Boats. Back. Mm -hmm. Back. Mm -hmm. Back. A houseboat? Mm -hmm. A houseboat? Maybe. Maybe rich in the luxury of Egypt might have had something similar to that. Yeah. But that wouldn't be something they experienced in Egypt. They were on the bottom rank. Back to the text of Numbers regarding Moshe's call to God to relieve his anguish over the lack of change in the people and the burden he feels. God acts with understanding, compassion, and a plan. Here's what he says in Bamibar, Numbers 11, starting with 16. Hashem said to Moshe, Gather to me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and its officers. Take them to the tents of meeting and stand them there with you. I will descend and speak with you there, and I will increase some of the spirit that is upon you and place it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, and you shall not bear it alone. So when, when we call out to God, when Moshe calls out to God, and he's being very honest, and he's just being very sincere, you can take your anger to God. Just because, you know, you want to pretend like you don't feel mad at God, that doesn't mean he doesn't already know that you are. So you take it to him, and he is so good and he's so merciful. Hopefully, he'll respond back to you with some kind of impression in your heart like he does to Moshe. He gives him immediately a solution. Okay, you feel that badly? You're bringing it to me? Here's the solution right there, right? You will not bear this alone, he said. Ezekiel 40... 25. He remember, if you have a runny nose, you don't necessarily want to be putting it near his face. Okay. Although I doubt it, I doubt he'll escape it. But God will. Uh -huh. I wake up to like everyone having faces. Yeah, they all have a cold, which is news to me. It just kind of showed up out of nowhere. I doubt it. Willing, it will be healed quickly and not have spread to anybody else. Ezekiel 40:25. Therefore, thus says the Lord Hashem Elohim: Now I will bring back the captivity of Jacob and show mercy to the entire house of Israel and be zealous for my holy name. They will bear their shame and their betrayal that they committed against me when they dwelt securely upon their soil, and none will make them afraid. When I return from them, the peoples, and gather them in from the land of their enemies, and become sanctified through them in the eyes of many nations, then they will know that I am Hashem, their God. For I have exiled them to the nations, and I will bring them to their land, and I will not leave any of them there. 
Then I will not hide my countenance from them again, for I will pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel. The word of Hashem Elohim. Is it, is it a no, it's not. Moshe responds as a servant, as one who lives to bring glory to God, not himself. He wants all the people to walk with the power of the Spirit, for the Spirit presence would be that which would change their hearts. This close fellowship is not designed for an elite few. It is available for all those who seek it. The Midbar 11, Numbers 11, 25 through 28. Hashem descended in a cloud and spoke to him, and he increased some of the Spirit that was upon him and gave it to the 70 men. The elders, when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. Two men remained behind in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the second was Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They had been among the recorded ones, but they had not gone out to the tent, and they prophesied in the camp. The youth ran and told Moshe, and he said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Jehoshua, son of Nun, the servant of Moshe, since his youth, spoke up and said, My lord Moshe, incarcerate them. Moshe said to him, Arrest them, or just seize them. Moshe said to him, Are you being zealous for my sake? Would that the entire people of Hashem would be prophets, if Hashem would but place his spirit upon them. So that's pretty cool. Uh, they were like Moses, they're trying to take their place or something? Yeah, I think Joshua was kind of like, that wasn't part of the plan. And Moshe was just kind of, his response was, and the whole problem is that, that the people aren't connecting to their spiritual capacity, right? Yeah. So even if there's two men doing it, outside of maybe my exact instruction, they're still... Doing it. <coughs> Excuse me? So he says, maybe I would that God would make everybody do such a thing, right? Okay. And they would really be in touch with their spirituality with Hashem. So, um, And then we have the Midbar 12, starting with verse 1. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moshe regarding the Cushite woman that he had married. For he had married a Cushite woman. They said, it was only... Was it only to Moshe that Hashem spoke? Did he not speak to us as well? And Hashem heard. Now, the man Moshe was exceedingly humble, more than any person on the face of the earth. Hashem said suddenly to Moshe, to Aaron, and to Miriam, you three, go out to the tent of meeting. And the three of them went out. Hashem descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. And he summoned our own and Miriam. Oh, so they actually spoke to him, like Moses. Yeah. And he stood there. He was all <laughs> whooping time. He said that, right? And then whooping time. And the two of them <laughs> went out. He said, Hear now my words. If there shall be prophets among you, in a vision I, Hashem, shall make myself known to them. In a dream I shall speak with him. Not so with my servant Moshe. In my entire house, he is the trusted one. Mouth to mouth do I speak to him. In a clear vision, and not in riddles. At the image of Hashem does he gaze. Why did you not fear? Why did you not fear to speak against my servant Moshe? What's that? I thought God didn't give you this. Can't hear you. I thought God what? <coughs> I thought God didn't give you this. Mm. I think he just means like in a vision. Mm -hmm. like really is there some things in the Torah that are kind of like, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for those of us who are, have a little bit less of a connection, or maybe it's not meant to be understood, or maybe we're not really looking at the right words, maybe not the right language, maybe we're not asking the right questions, then maybe that seems like a riddle to us. 
but to Moshe, he is, is, the Torah is very clearly written. Um, but yeah, there still are some things, definitely in the Bible as a whole, that we don't really understand. And then he's talking about future prophets. My goodness, some of Ezekiel is very wild. It's just very wild and out there. It's very vivid, but it's also a little bit of a riddle. So this, what we were just reading, is a clear picture of a father, our father, calling the kids front and center. There is an issue that must be addressed, and he will ensure that those who have his ears those who have ears to hear connect these par parallel exhortations. Hashem calls Moshe the trusted of his house. Moshe is the scribe and reporter, the orator and supervisor of that which was given from the divine and heavenly realm. Even more so, from the very heart of our maker, the Torah. He is the custodian in whose hands the foundations of all instructions from God, the firm and lasting base of all scripture, El Elyon, the Most High God was entrusted. Why then is there no fear to speak against Moshe? Why then is there no foreboding to cast the Torah aside? The Master is very clear. If you do not trust the Torah, how will you be able to understand and believe in him? John 5:35. He was a lamp burning and shining, and for a while you were willing to bask in his light. But I have a testimony greater than Yohanan's. For the things the Father has given me to do, the very things I am doing now testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. In addition, the Father who has sent me has himself testified on my behalf. But you have never heard his voice, nor seen his shape. Moreover, his word does not stay in you because you do not trust the one he sent. You keep examining the Tanakh because you think that in it you have eternal life. Those very scriptures bear witness to me, but you won't come to me in order to have life. But don't think that it is I who will be your accuser before the Father. Do you know who will accuse you? Moshe, the very one you counted on. For if you really believed Moshe, you would believe me, because it was about me that he wrote. But if you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? What do you guys think about that? So that is, yes, absolutely, he's saying that. That last part is what really stuck out to me personally, and I'm thinking of it on a different angle. I'm thinking of it of the people who reject the Torah. They say, oh, that's a good thing to learn, but we don't have to keep it, right? Because believing is what? Do. Believing is doing. Believing is acting on it. Faith without works is dead. Works without the spirit are empty. So, but he says, listen, if you do not believe what he wrote, like keep the Sabbath, like all the words of this law are your life, how are you going to believe what I say? I think that's really powerful. <clears throat> the Proverbs passage, which we're about, Proverbs passage, which we're about to read, is a window into the extent of Hashem's anger and wrath against Miriam for stirring up strife among brothers. It is the abomination of his soul, Hashem says. From Proverbs 6 and starting with 12, the lawless, the Torahless man is a man of iniquity. He goes forth with distortion of the mouth. He winks with his eyes, shuffles with his feet, points his fingers, is duplicit, duplicity in his heart. He plots evil all the time. He stirs up strife. Therefore, his undoing will come suddenly. He will be broken in an instant without healing. Hashem hates these six, but the seventh is the abomination of his soul. Haughty eyes, a false tongue, and hands spilling innocent blood, a heart plotting iniquitous thoughts, feet hastening to run to evil, 
a false witness spouting lies and one who stirs up strife among his brothers. No, we're going to finish. We're getting towards the end here. You can dry, you can color, and then I'll get us lunch together, okay? You had a long break in between, so you're good to go. And if you're not good to go, you can go to your room and you can just stay there for the rest of the afternoon, okay? That's your choice to do and you can make that choice. The Mead Bar, chapter 12, starting with verse 9. The wrath of Hashem flared up against them, and he left. The cloud had departed from atop the tent, and behold, Miriam was afflicted with Sarah, like snow. Aaron turned to Miriam, and behold, she was afflicted with Sarah. Aaron said to Moshe, I beg you, my lord, do not cast a sin upon us, for we have been foolish and we have sinned. Let her not be like a corpse, like one who leaves his mother's womb with a half of his flesh having been consumed. Moshe cried out to Hashem, like saying, like Oh gosh, that's terrible. Yeah. I wonder what the connection is there. He interrupted the verse, but it was with a comment saying that's like the abortions, the partial birth abortions, or abortions in general, where they tear the child apart to get it out of the womb. Moshe cried out to Hashem saying, please God, heal her now. Hashem said to Moshe, were her father to spit in her face, would she not be humiliated for seven days? Let her be quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and then she may be brought in. So Miriam was quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not journey until Miriam was brought in. Then the people journeyed from Hazarot, and they encamped in the wilderness of Paran. I want you to go to the bathroom, and I want you to wash your face and your hands and try and blow out your nose. You can't be sitting there licking it, and you can't be sitting there messing with it with your hands. That's disgusting. Okay, thank you. You can go lay down in your bed. You can lay down in your bed. Okay, that would be fine for now. You're welcome. The text says, no, not here. You go to the bathroom and deal with it, okay? She can open her window. We're good. The text says, Aaron and Miriam spoke against Moshe, right? seems strange that the subject starts out with some question about the woman Moshe married, or as the sages say, the lack of attention Moshe was paying his wife. Why then does the subject switch so swiftly to, who does daddy love more? The Lord is quick to strongly defend his humble servant, and we see that it is only Miriam that is afflicted. The Sarat affliction was said to have come as an, uh, hold on just a minute, I'll, I'll let you talk in just a sec, um, as an indication of Lashon Hara, the evil tongue, which consists of gossip, idle chatter, slander, etc. Even repeating something that's true without the other person there to be able to defend themselves, that's considered Lashon Hara, which is clearly what Miriam must have been instigating. And although Aaron is mentioned, he is not punished. It could be because he is Kohen Gadol and needs to save face, but this seems unlikely with a just God executing his righteous judgment. Our own must have been in some way innocent in the eyes of the Lord, yet he is still a part of the verbal warning. Our own pleads with Moshe. Hold on just a minute. Moshe prays to God. God responds quickly, but this time he makes Miriam an example. Yes, in the desert, everyone plays a part. We are all equally challenged. All will be, albeit in different ways. And there is no special protection or specialized treatment, even for a prophetess of Hashem. She murmurs. The people murmur. The Lord has had his fill. All right, I will pause. First, keep your question in mind, Leora, but first what? Um, Malachi? Well, what important role did Miriam play? I mean, like, what was her job? Like, we don't have much. 
anything of her. Mm -hmm. Except that one. Oh, yeah. And then, out, and also, you look around, she's a fish, 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 so your point is, do you think, are you saying that you think that uh, Miriam got Sarah uh, because she wasn't really that important? No, I mean, she's important, but she just... And it's a good question, what does the text say of her importance? In the, in the last okay, so good question. Let's talk about Miriam for a minute. First of all, I don't think it's fair to say because the Torah currently hasn't said anything about Miriam that she's not important. I think if we go all the way back, well, that means, let's I, go back to Egypt and let me just answer and I'll answer through what I know that the sages teach. Okay, can I teach you to share, share that with you? And you know that that's where that's coming from. First of all, what we know is that probably there'd be no Moshe if there was no Miriam, at the time when Yocheved uh, and Amram were down there in Egypt, they had this ordeal to where the boys are being slaughtered. They're thinking to themselves, if we stay together, we're probably going to have more children. And if we do that, what's the fate of the child if it's a son? So they separate. Miriam comes to her dad and says, you're worse than Paro. Because he just wanted to kill just the boys. You're saying just separating all together, the family. Amram knew she was right. They come together. Moshe is born. Okay, this is what the sages teach. Then we have this, from the Bible, we have this, she's watching. She's right there with her mom. She's standing alert at attention. What's going to be with this child, right? And she follows, and she's like in the right place at the right time. She speaks up when she should. She is vital to the future of this entire nation, to the redemption, right? They leave. She merits to sing this song at the sea that she's called the prophetess. So although we don't have like a list of all her works and all her prophecies, she was deeply involved with the community. She's one of the top three heads, right? So while maybe the men are more comfortable going to the men, how many women are there in this community and who do you think they're going to go to? Furthermore, it says that in the merit of Miriam, that's the well of Miriam, the water that they drink from. Because when she dies, guess what happens? The water stops. You remember that? Yeah. So she's really, really important. And she's like the big sister who kind of holds everything together. You know? So that's a that's a thing. But the point I think of, of her getting Sarah Ott is to say no one's above the law. God punishes according to the deed. Our own was there, but is he the one? Probably not, because he didn't get it, and he could have gotten it, and he should have gotten it, and he would have gotten it had that been the case. God doesn't say, oh no, he's a Kohen, so he can't get punished. No, that's not the way that it works. If you sin, you're responsible for that. So, God, stop. There. He was just there. She was tied with her issue was probably coming from a really good place again the sages teach that her issue was that Moshe was so concerned with his life as this leader of this people and all the things that he had to do that he had no concern for his wife that he was neglecting her I think she probably had a good intention, but guess what? That's still a Shan Hara. Furthermore, what's the real issue here? God talks to us too. 
God wants to make a distinction for all time, for all people. No. The Torah is not like other things, other writings, other even prophets. The Torah is very valuable. And when I'm saying that, why I'm talking about the Torah is because Moshe is the author of the Torah. So God wanted to make a distinction. There may be other words from the Lord. There be, may be other people who come along who say they are a prophet. But there is nothing like this Torah. And I think that's another lesson, too. So hopefully that gives you something to go on. Leor, do you remember your question? The children who were in Egypt, what did they do? I cannot know that. I do not know that. They, you think about the Holocaust. What kind of things did the children do in the Holocaust? They still work them. Little errand jobs, little yucky jobs, you know, clean up jobs. Who knows? Running back and forth with messages or um, other things. Or dancing? Or dancing? No. I don't know about that. There probably might have been some kind of yucky obsession with children dancing in all of those twisted occurrences. Who knows? Okay, let's go on to the next question you had. Because that one I really can't answer because I don't know. Who died first? Arona Miriam, do you guys know who died first? Who? Yeah. So Miriam first, our own second, Moshe last, mm -hmm. before they entered into the land. Or the youngest. Hmm? Or the youngest. Yeah. Why did our own die? Because he was old, and all the men from that generation had to had to die before they could enter into the land, including Moshe. What did Miriam do to deserve to be out of the camp? She talked about Moshe without him being there to defend himself. She compared herself, her prophecy, her level of prophecy to Moshe's. And there was something going on that Hashem did not approve of in the way that she was speaking. She was an example. She was a really high example. This is another point to be made. Miriam was a very high example. You have to be very aware that... The all the eyes are on you. Now, if she starts talking like that, and do you know what? This is what happens for the rest of the book of the Midbar. If she starts talking like that, we're like Moshe. You know what happens next week? Korach. I want to be Kohen Gadol. Once the strife in the family starts, where I can be like Moshe, the other people follow that example. So that's why God was like, no, no, no. You're not like Moshe. You're important, you're valuable. It's really important that leader, leaders know that the others that are watching them are going to follow their ways. And that's what happens for the rest of the book of the Midbar. So that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Anything else? Why did Moshe die? There was an element of being old, but there was also that the people couldn't enter into the land of Israel until he was gone. There, this was a shift. Joshua needed to lead them in. Moshe couldn't go in because, remember, he struck the rock the second time. That was another occasion where it was like, it's really important that you set a good example right here, right now. That you prove to them that it's not you who is doing all of this, that it's me, Hashem. So he wasn't able to go into the land, so he had to die also before they went into the land. And she got sent out for seven days, and then this shows their val her value. They waited. They waited until she was received back in, and then they traveled. Because she was special. They didn't do that for all the Sarat people, but just for her. Okay. Such good discussion. Now we're going to go on to Proverbs 10. The mouth of the righteous one is a source of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals their intended violence. Hatred arouses strife, but love covers all offenses. Romans 16, 17, I urge you, brothers, 
to watch out for those who cause divisions and put snares alongside the teaching in which you have been trained. Keep away from them. For men like these are not serving the Lord, the Messiah, but their own belly. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the innocent concerning evil. And God, the source of shalom, will soon crush the adversary under your feet. How quickly things can change. From a firm foothold, swift deviation from the heart of the plan. To, to swift deviation from the, to the heart of the plan. The message this week seems clear. Hearken to the sound of the godly leadership we have as we await our coming king. Always be looking for the cloud and the fire of the Lord. Bless you. Every step of our every day to guide us through our journey. Find the treasure of contentment in the Lord's provision and combat grumbling with the heart of thanksgiving. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the entire counsel of your living word. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Almighty King. In Yeshua's name, Amen. My, my King, I pray that you will do a deep heart working within each of your children. We cannot hide or mask our true intentions from the one who formed us in the womb. I pray for clarity and purity of motivation in our service to you and how we treat others. May we hearken and realize it is your own you have dealings with, your own you wish to refine. There is much work to be done and it seems overwhelming at times, a vast desert before us. Please guide us and lead us, sustain us and we will rest in you. Thank you, my King, for life and for all the wonders you have set around us. May you be magnified by all creation, and may the mouth of every soul praise your holy name. In Yeshua's name I ask these things. Amen. And then there's two more scriptures to end it out. Zechariah, Zechariah 3, 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the Kohen Gadol, standing before the angel of Hashem. And the Satan, the Satan, was standing on his right to accuse him. The angel of Hashem said to the Satan, May Hashem denounce you, O Satan. May Hashem, who chooses Jerusalem, denounce you. Indeed, this man is like a firebrand, rescued from a fire. Revelation 12 and 10. Now have come God's victory, power, and kingship, and the authority of his Messiah, because the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them day and night before God, has been thrown out. They defeated him because of the Lamb's blood and because of the message of their witness. Shabbat Shalom. Let's see. Let's just see real quick if there's any. There's no questions. If you have any questions, you can comment them and we can talk about them. Baruch Hashem. Shabbat Shalom, everybody.